Buddy, we're, we're excited to have you on. Thanks for being here. Um, so let's go ahead and get started a little bit. Um, so coming up, we have a few different events. We always mention our three-day asset protection summits. Uh, so we have a few dates coming up here. And then let's go there. Oh, let's do upcoming webinars first. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's go back there and look at those. So our upcoming webinars, we have a lot. Take a look at this list here of topics uh, when you get a chance here. This is basically uh, what we try to do every other week, at least, if not more. We have several different legal, tax, financial topics. And we really try to find the best of the best on these topics. Attorneys, CPAs, financial advisors, investors, for people that you know really can help you and your families do better. We love this. So jump on there. You'll see a lot of that. Uh, we have asset protection, tax, legal strategies. A lot of you know Scott Estel, last minute tax strategies. That's before, that is before uh, April 15th. Isn't that done? Yes. Okay. So that's a good one to jump into. Mike Colval, we love on stock investing strategies. Uh, and a lot of other attorneys and advisors strongly suggest you jump on those. And make sure you sign up. Uh, if you're on the webinar, you're already signed up, but make sure you sign up for those. They'll be sent to your email. It's not automatic. You do have to register for those webinars individually. Okay, so, and if you miss a lot of our webinars, at least for your questions, Sherry, is uh, perfect. Yes, we do record these for the most part. And yes, for the most part, we put them on YouTube. So if you haven't had a chance to go to our YouTube channel, make sure and go to youtube.com slash protect wealth academy and subscribe so don i love how you spelled this out go to youtube type in protect wealth academy and you'll see that red button hit subscribe so what that's meant to do is give you the option to see our videos and then if you also select notifications and you're in youtube it will send you a notification when we post a new video now that's not every video uh and obviously you can't get your questions answered live. So always attend live, but we do record them at least for 30 days, post them on our YouTube channel. So try and jump in there. Okay, and then we talk about the three-day asset protection summit. This is our premier event for three days on asset protection, tax, financial strategies, uh, stock investing, real estate investing. We bring it all together for you. Uh, and really, this is something that we're very proud of. This is really is, excuse me, our premier event. And we're proud of the fact that we do weave asset protection, you know, uh, with tax and with estate planning. Sometimes you have attorneys or CPAs that are great on tax, but not great on asset protection. And sometimes, Don, you see it all the time. I know it. Someone might, a CPA might tell you, well, don't do this. Don't put it into an LLC or a corporation. Well, that's exactly what you probably should have done from an asset protection standpoint, but it makes no sense from tax or vice versa. And so we weave all those topics together, asset protection, tax, estate planning, and then we, we mix in some of the real estate and uh, uh, stock investing. So next one coming up, March 7th through 9th, and then April 25th, 26th, 27th. You can find more about that at protectwealth.com. Definitely suggest you look at the agenda there online. We've got a lot of different topics. Uh, absolutely look at the, the agenda. You'll see that we are heavy in content, and we provide a lot of uh, really good instruction, similar to what Don's going to talk about tonight. Okay, uh, legal disclaimer, this is meant to be a informational event only. It's not meant to be specific legal, financial, or tax advice for you. If you need specific advice, definitely contact you know, somebody competent who can look at you personally one-on-one. -on -one. Meant to be educational, not uh, something specific for you. Always disclaimer, we do asset protection. So <laughs> we also uh, always do a legal disclaimer before everything we do. Okay, well, uh, let's get started then, Don. I'm so excited about tonight's webinar. I, I have seen this, like I said, I have seen a little bit of preview on this. This, like you said, is going to be probably one of the number one questions we get asked about this. Honestly, I've never seen it taught in this way before. And Don is a master at this, explaining things. But this goes even further to, it blew my mind. And Don and I have been doing this for, like you said, 20 years 
And this blew my mind because we've never taught it this way. The clarity you're going to get tonight for legally structuring your business. You know, if, if you have any kind of business or investments, how do you structure it? Is it a corporation? Is it an LLC? Is it a limited partnership? Where do you put it? Don will cover all that tonight. And they're, they're honestly, in my opinion, there's nobody better than Don to teach it. Uh, that is true. So Don, thank you so much for teaching this. Uh, turn the time over to you. But first, before you start questions, Q&A screen, UK to hold off most of those really to the end, because a lot of times people will ask questions and you'll cover them later on in the, in the presentation. Yeah, we're going to break it down, but but the the presentation is set to be able to answer your questions. And so if we if you can hold off on the questions, um, and, but write them down or, or submit them, but I probably won't take time other than this one. Do we have any upcoming webinars on on Cook Island and trusts and offshore trusts? We have in the past, we've had multiple uh, attorneys, but right now we don't have anything scheduled. For most of our, our clients, going offshore is a little more than what they need. And so uh, at least right now, we don't have anything scheduled. So sorry no, about that. A lot of the marketing you see, according to the marketing, everybody needs a Cook Island Trust. Well, that's yeah. a lot of what you can do off Cook Islands, you can do right here. Domestic. Almost everything that we can do um, without the IRS scrutiny, we can do in Nevada, Wyoming, Delaware. There's so many great laws in America. Once we learn to use those, we don't have to give somebody else outside of the, the bounds of the United States um, power to be the trustee over your estate. They're, we're kind of control freaks that way. We like you to be in control of the assets and and not be under the radar of the United States, but certainly not raise lots of red flags. So, um, yeah, it, 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 currently nothing scheduled. So, okay, so okay. yeah, let's get started. Thanks, Tom. So, um, by far the most common question that I get when, when I'm sitting down with people one-on-one -on -one or over the 20 years we've run an asset protection hotline, um, the most common question is, okay, what's the best legal structure for me? And so I, I want to break this down the very best way that I can uh, and how to select the very best legal structure for your business. And, and there's a couple basic rules I want to get to before we even talk about legal structures. Once you understand these, it will make a whole bunch more sense. Number one is we always keep valuable biz assets out of an operating company. Now, that seems like a very simple concept, but, but <laughs> um, it, I, I don't... Uh, there's operating companies that are going to have liability. They're going to be exposed. They're, they're out advertising. They're saying, hey, you know, come here. We, we want your business. Um, we can serve you better than anybody else. But we don't put real estate, for instance. We don't put large equipment in an operating company. Why? Because we want to keep that operating company lean and mean. If it's ever sued, it doesn't own the real estate. It leases the real estate. It doesn't own the equipment. Maybe it doesn't own the intellectual property, the patents, the copyrights. The valuable assets we keep out of the operating company and lease or license or manage um, the assets, but we, we keep the assets in an operating company to a bare minimum. <laughs> the, other, the other basic thing I want that will help is that we're trying to separate your active activities from your passive activities and send as much money down and, and create passive income for you that's not subject to 15.3% self-employment taxes. So we might manage our properties out of a management company, but the ownership that, that, that we want that to be passive and, and make you eligible for lower income tax rates. So those two basic things, keep valuable assets out of an operating company and separate passive from active activities. Once you understand that, that will help understand what we're, where we're going to go with this. There's four steps in my mind to selecting a proper entity for you. Um, Clarifying what the business purpose is, selecting a legal, the, the proper legal structure. 
which is a very different question is how do I want to tax the little bugger and what state do I want to put it in? A lot of people will right off the bat go, okay, I'm a real estate investor. Should I be an LLC? And should I be a C Corp? Well, there's really two different questions. Um, should I be a corporation and should I be taxed as a C corporation and should I be a Nevada court? Well, so I'm going to try to break these down and go through these. And this is really the foundation of what we're going to be talking about tonight is clarifying your business purpose, selecting the proper legal structure, the best jurisdiction and the best tax for your, for your business. All right, so let's start with a basic summary. For most people that have assets to protect, um, we generally want to start with an operating company. We start with a holding company. Let's say we ran, you, you've got a large portfolio um, of stocks and bonds and mutual funds. We would hold that in your holding company, but we would manage it through the corporation. As a result of having two entities, one that owns, one to manage. So what do I've done? You basically set up your own little Charles Schwab, your own Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley to manage assets. As a result of you not be the operating company not owning them, then it's eligible for all types of tax perks um, let's say I'm running running 10 of my own rental properties. I would operate that through a real estate management company, but hold the real estate in a holding company or a series of holding companies. If I was running a residential assisted living, I would operate that through the operating company. That's where I would hire the employees. I would advertise, but the holding company would simply own the real estate. Um, Hilton, Marriott, great examples of how this works. One, own, one entity owns the business, owns the real estate, and one manages it. And what ties these two entities together is a well-worded management agreement that's nothing more than a great big finger pointing at the management company saying, it's your fault. Because this million, multi-million dollar property might be freeway accessible, it might be um, it might be, you know, I don't know, airport accessible. There's a lot of money tied up in that in that real estate holding company. So what we want to do is we want to shift by contract all risk. If somebody dies in the swimming pool, it's his fault. If somebody gets poisoned in the restaurant, it's his fault. We're shifting away from the equity in real estate up to a management company that really owns little bottles of shampoo and and bottles of water and used bed sheets and assets that nobody wants. We want to keep the operating company lean and mean. Remember, that was rule number one. And rule number two is now we want to separate the passive from the active. The holding company did not actively manage that business. Therefore, any because the operating company had hired somebody else to do it. I didn't actively manage the, the stocks. The operating company, my, my investment company did. And so as a result of that, now I, anything that you take out of the holding company, I don't have to pay 15.3% self-employment taxes. Again, I'm separating the active income of the operating company from the passive income of the holding company. Now, I also know that, that there, and most of you are going to have a revocable living trust. In this discussion tonight, let's just assume that you know that, and this will be a discussion for a later date because I really want to talk about the legal structures of you know corporations, limited partnership, LLCs. Know that they'll tie into a trust, but that's not where we're going to go tonight. Let's talk specifically about the operating company. What could be a business purpose for an operating company? Well, maybe it's to manage my real estate holdings. Maybe it's manage lots of people's holdings. But, but I'm, again, I'm separate. This is an active business. Maybe it's simply to manage my own investments. I've got a little stock over here. It's a little real estate over here. Maybe I've got some, I don't know, whatever. Maybe I'm buying and selling silver or automobiles or whatever it is. 
Maybe I've got a medical or a dental facility, maybe a retail store, a residential assisted living or a shared housing facility. Maybe I'm simply doing consulting. Um, and, in, in, you know, there, there are some of these. Um, I'm doing household services. Maybe I'm a contractor or I'm, I'm doing cleaning services. I'm flipping houses, whatever it is. There's hundreds and maybe thousands of business purposes you can have. Whatever you do, we want you to keep the, the, the assets in there fairly small. Now, if I'm sitting at my home desk and I'm doing some consulting for people or I've got an online business, maybe we don't need an operating company or a holding company. Maybe it's all we need is the operating company. But, but the business purpose is something that's actively, I'm actively managed. I'm actively trying to make money. Remember, in the eyes of the IRS, for you to have a business, as all I need is the intent to make a profit. I don't even have to be successful. The IRS says if you have the intent to make a profit in this business venture, you're a business. Now, we haven't got to, oh, my gosh, it should be a corporation or an LLC or just it's an operating company right now. 10,000 foot view and let's let's look down on it. The holding company is going to be very differently. What would be the business purpose of a holding company? Well, it would be to own the investments. It's not managing them. It's simply owning. It owns the real estate. It owns the intellectual property, the patents, copyrights, trademarks. It owns the equipment, et cetera. Um, again, even a holding company has to have the intent to make a profit. Sometimes we run into this with students that want to put their personal residence into a, into a holding company. And we go, well, there, there's re really no business intent for this. You're not intending to make, well, I mean, you know, ho hopefully your house appreciates. Or they put their, you know, their boat or their vehicles into a, an, into a business entity without the intent to make a profit. Well, that doesn't work all that well. And so even a holding company, you need the intent to make a profit. What are the assets? Let's go back to an operating company. What are the assets that a holding, that, I'm sorry, that an operating company would own? Well, it would own certainly a bank account so that you can put money in, so that you can collect money from your, your students, your clients, your I don't know, whatever, um, you, you, it, that would certainly be an asset. And then it would own the depreciating tools of your business. It might be a cell phone. It might be a calculator. might be a laptop. It might be a lot of the, but the things that really aren't worth much. We're not putting major assets, but, but, but small depreciating assets. Accounts receivable and inventory would always go in the operating company. Now, if I've got a lot of money tied up, let's say I'm a grocery store and I've got a couple million dollars worth of, of inventory, or I'm a dentist office, I've got a lot of accounts receivable, we can encumber those to keep them safe with debt or with liens or friendly liens or whatever. But um, we would, if you, if you try to hold accounts receivable, and inventory outside of that and lease those, you're going to cause all kinds of tax problems. So, so accounts receivable, every business is going to have maybe a few little office supplies. But again, what we're doing with this, and that the, the point I want to make is that operating company is really lean. Nobody really wants your used pencil. Thank you, but it's not an attractive asset in, in a lawsuit. Um, real estate would be, what, you know, that this building is leased to our company, but it's not, certainly not owned by the operating company. What are the assets then of a holding company? Well, that's very different. This is where we put the big stuff. This is where we put our brokerage accounts. This might be where we put the real estate, our, our bank accounts, the big savings accounts. This is where I put equipment. This is where I put the vehicles that, that maybe the, the company uses. If I've got a construction company, the heavy equipment is held in a holding company and leased to the operating company, keeping the operating company lean. And any money that comes to me through that holding company, again, we want it to be passive by nature. 
this is where I'm going to keep intellectual property like uh, copyrights and trademarks and patents. Um, I can't really keep trade secrets in a holding company, but but that type of intellectual property we could. So in essence, the, the holding company, the, the design is to keep major assets. Again, operating company, lean and mean, the holding company is major assets that are leased or managed or something. Okay. So with that basics, and I know that's very basic for a lot of you on the call, but, but number one, I wanted you to select a business purpose and really determine whether what you're, what you're creating is a holding company or whether it's an operating company. Once that's really clear in your mind, then we can go to selecting the proper legal structure. Here are your options that you will have as in creating a business. There's a sole proprietorship, there's a general partnership, limited partnerships, LLCs or limited liability companies and corporations. And I'm gonna break these down individually. But before I do, remember the first thing I wanted you to do is to select the business purpose. Now that now we know whether it's an operating business, let me give you some basic information. If it's an operating business, you have three options. You can be a sole proprietorship, an LLC, or a corporation. But I would never, ever, ever run a business out of, let's say, my IRA. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to run a business out of a limited partnership. Here are your three best options. And I put sole proprietorship in parentheses, kind of going, that's not our best option, but every once in a while it might work. But really, LLCs and corporations are the way to run an operating business. A holding company is very different. This is when I would hold assets, let's say a brokerage account or real estate, I would hold those in limited partnerships, in LLCs, and sometimes in retirement vehicles, like a self-directed IRA, self-directed 401k. Um, those are good holding companies because they protect the assets better. The, the operating company, we, we really want tax perks. We want, we want to put our name out. We want to operate that. But to own the business, I want something with good charging order protection. We'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. Operating companies, we want something with good corporate veil protection. If something happens, you as the officer, director, or shareholder shielded. But with, an, with a holding company, I really want something that has good charging order protection. If I personally get sued, they can't, can't come get the asset away from me. All right. We'll get into that a little bit. Here we go. Let's talk about each one of those five entities all by themselves. A sole proprietorship is simple to form, as all you need is the intent to make a profit, and you are, by law, you are a sole proprietorship. I don't have to file this with any state agency. I don't have to let the IRS know. I, I simply start a business, and I have the intent to make a profit, and, and there's no liability protection because I really am the business. In the eyes of the court, there is no corporate veil for me. I can't hide behind that and say, well, that was, that was the business. No, you are the business. What you're saying um, to the courts when you set up a sole proprietorship is make me liable for everything that happens in that business. What you're saying to the IRS is give me the least number of tax deductions of available to man. And so as running a serious business, it's probably not a great idea. However, There are times when a sole proprietorship is exactly what a person needs. I see that when, you know, a husband has so many ideas. And what if, what if we do this and we could do this? Or, or a wife goes, oh, my gosh, or a woman, or somebody comes and I've got so many ideas. What if I just try the idea, get it up and get it running, start a business, you don't even need a separate bank account. Try your idea. See if it has merit. But my son, for instance, is a triple black belt in Taekwondo. He wants to break off on his own. And, and so should I be an LLC? Should I? Why don't you just go out and put out some flyers and see if you can get some new clients and, and try that. 
And then if you're successful at that, then let's set up the LLC and let's get serious about business. But, but, but a sole proprietorship is a good testing ground. It's also good for home-based businesses when there's no employees, when there's no outside partners, and when there's little to no liability. However, once you have employees, once you get making money, and, and then this is a serious business, a sole proprietorship is not the place where most of you want to be. Because again, increased liability and, and a lot less tax deductions. And maybe I'll add one other negative. And, and this is of all the business structures you could have, this will be the highest audit rate of any business to the extent sometimes of 10 to 15% of sole proprietorships are going to get audited where the others might be far less than 1%. It's a big difference. Okay. There's a thing called a general partnership. Now, again, this is simple to form. This is a handshake deal between you and somebody else and you go into business and I don't have to file any state forms. There's no tax returns, but what you're saying is not only make me liable for everything that happens in the business, I want to be responsible for all of his mistakes and her mistakes as well. This is a general partnership. There's no, there doesn't have to be a written agreement. Maybe there is. Um, what also means is that there's joint and several liability, which means if partner screws up, I can be held a hundred percent liable, even though I didn't, I, I didn't know he went out and took a $50,000 loan against the business. That's okay. You're liable because you're a partner. Any liabilities that he creates, you can be responsible for. So what would this be appropriate for? I, you know, I've, I've, I've thought about this a lot. And in 22 years of running a hotline, I've never suggested a general partnership to anyone. So when would it be appropriate? And the only time that I've ever been able to think that a general partnership would, would be like a little lemonade stand for your kids, they get together, <laughs> any serious business, I would never recommend a general partnership. I think it's too, too risky. And so with that, but, but it is an option. And I, I just don't think it's a good option. I think it's like an F rated asset protection tool. All right, so I crossed that through and corporations. Corporations are the traditional way that, that we've done business in America. This is how, if you're serious about business, we set up a corporation. It has corporate veil protection, which, which means that if something happens in this corporation and you're running it correctly, you're keeping a separate set of books and a separate bank account and you're doing your meetings and minutes and resolutions and you're, you're running it right. You're not commingling funds. Then there's a corporate veil, which means if something, any liability that happens, debts, obligations inside of the corporation don't affect the officers, directors, or shareholders. That's a good thing. We like that. But with a corporation, there are formalities. There, it, you should have a annual shareholders meeting, an annual board of directors meeting. Even if it's a one person corporation, you're, you're expected to hold these meetings and keep minutes at them. Uh, a corporation has rights as a person, which means it can sue people. It can be sued. The corporation can own property. It has, it can defend itself in court. It can stand up and it, it has legal rights as a person. It also has perpetual existence. Even if you, the owner, dies, the corporation can, can, can continue on for generations at a time. Um, there's more tax deductions in a corporation than there are in any other type of, of form of ownership. So this is the traditional way that that business has been run. The fourth way to run a business is a as a limited partnership. This has been the traditional way that we own assets, not run a business, but we own the assets. Um, traditionally, we, if we've held real estate, we would hold that in a limited partnership, maybe lease that or let the, the corporation manage it. Uh, limited partnerships have what's called charging order protection. 
let's say there's five of us, we get together, we all invest money. If one of the partners gets sued, a judgment creditor can't come in and take the assets out because there's innocent parties. The only thing that the judgment creditor would be allowed in most states is they could put a charging order or a lien against that member's interest in the LLC or the, the or I'm sorry, the, the partnership. So the, the nice thing about that is they can't come in in most cases and, and take your interest away or take the assets out. Um, you're limited in the liability. If you're a limited partner, the third bullet, if you're a limited partner, I have no liability other than I could lose the assets I invested. But if something happens in there, I, general partner is, a, is at risk, but not me. Passive income, if, if this is being run right, this limited partnership, all the income that comes to me would be passive by nature. Um, we'll use that. We love limited partnerships and things taxed as partnerships because of the flow through <coughs> taxation that they have. Uh, depreciation deductions and, and <coughs> losses and and it, there's so many advantages to owning real estate on the tax side. We like things, you know, we, we like limited partnerships for that. So the tax, the pass-through benefits. Limited partnerships traditionally don't have the same requirements for corporate formalities. So it, ease of operation. I don't have to do the minutes and meetings and resolutions, stock certificates, stock ledgers with the state, corporate seals. Um, <coughs> All of the, the corporate formality nonsense that small businesses don't traditionally do anyway. And, and finally, limited partnerships give us the ability to spread income to lower tax brackets. Let's say it's, it's a family-owned limited partnership. We own 10 pieces of real estate. And I'm gifting slowly my interests to my kids. Eventually, um, it's paying for their college. Eventually, it's paying them, you know, but it allows us to shift income to lower tax brackets and spread the income out. So that's a limited partnership. Now, this one is recognized by a state. It has to be filed. There is a tax return with a limited partnership. It's recognized and it can have really good partnership agreements where, oh, they're incredible asset protection that come through a limited partnership. Again, this is a recognized by the state, recognized by the federal government. You're, you're now graduating. This is not a general partnership. This is a limited partnership, much, much stronger. And then the last way to run a business would be a LLC. This combines all the major benefits of a corporation with a limited partnership. It's taking the best of both worlds. From the limited partnership side, it brings charging order protection. From the corporation side, it brings corporate veil protection. So if something happens, I can't sue the officers and directors. If the lawsuit comes to them, we can't take their interest away. That's good. Um, so we like that. The, we like the limited liability to the members. We like the ease of operation. We like the pass through that a lot of times corporation or LLCs can have. We like the tax flexibility of an LLC. So once you decide your business purpose, now we decide which one of these five ways do you want you want to set up a business. Um, <coughs> is it going to be a holding company or is it an operating or operating company? And then most most businesses today um, our most operating companies are set up as LLCs, taxed as corporations, and most holding companies are set up as LLCs, taxed as partnerships. We'll get to that in a minute. The third thing we have to do is let's determine um, what state you're going to file this in. And I'm going to give you, and, and this is probably where it becomes fuzziest of all, um, which entity, it, it's pretty clear. Um, and then I can give you some general guidelines 
Um, if it's going to own real estate, almost always it's going to be an LLC. How many members? Uh, that that'll depend on who's contributing the assets. Um, the tax should I be taxed as an S corp or a C corp? That that there's some general rules, but this one I'm going to give you some general rules and know that there's exceptions to every thing that I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to give you the basics. For an operating company, and you'll notice this is green, operating companies, I'm always going to show in green just so that you, you understand where I'm going. Almost always, that operating company is going to be formed in the state where you're doing business. If I'm doing a grocery store, I've got, a, I'm doing business in, in Tennessee, I really need that to be formed in Tennessee. I can't do a Wyoming holding or a Wyoming entity doing business and you know, just file it where you're doing business. I, if it's a professional corporation of some kind, I'm an attorney or I'm an accountant or an engineer or a nurse or a doctor. If I'm going to set up a business, it has to be filed in the state where you're doing business. Look, when, when you're hanging a shingle out and, and attracting business, and you're saying, hey, come to me because this is the go-to. I'm trying to make money in the state of Alabama. This most likely is going to be an Alabama entity. Operating companies are generally formed in the state where you're doing business. Publicly traded corporations, you'll notice anybody on the Dow um, in any of the big corporations are always going to be Delaware corporations. Why? And then they, they sometimes will list those and file foreign entity status in various states. But why? Because Delaware protects shareholders better than any other state. And there, there's really good laws in Delaware for, for, for protecting the shareholders. Nevada, Wyoming, protect the officers and directors better than any other state. And most small businesses, your, your, your chance of being sued because you're the shareholder are very limited. The chance of being sued because you're an officer or director. So sometimes for operating companies, we might go to Nevada or Wyoming. Sometimes we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Companies that are doing business in multiple states might have to file foreign entity status. So let's say I live in Utah, I set up my corporation, but now I also want to run in Montana and Wyoming. I might have to, depending on the nature of the business, file my Utah corporation to do business in Wyoming and in Idaho and Montana. And, and, and so it depends on how much business you're doing. If I'm going to have one client a year in Wyoming, I probably haven't established what's called nexus. If I have a, a big portion of my clients um, coming from Nevada, Wyoming, I might have to file as a foreign entity doing business in that state. And then another basic rule, private corporations that are not doing business per se in any state, let's say I'm simply managing my own portfolio. I've got a million dollars in stock. I want the tax benefits of having a management company. Could I file that in a state with some anonymity um, with Nevada, Wyoming, um, maybe Delaware? Um, yes, but, but know that whenever, I, it's, well, let me leave it at, most of the time, operating companies are going to be filed where you're doing business. There's a few exceptions. Let's say I live in California and I'm simply managing my million dollar portfolio. Could I set that up in, in Nevada, my corporation? Yes, because I'm you're technically not hanging a shingle out looking for other people to invest. Those are the basic rules for, for jurisdiction on operating companies. Now, this is going to be very, very different when we come to a holding company. Holding company, the basic rules are wherever the real estate, if you're, if you're going to put real estate in a holding company, you're going to file that in the state where you're doing, where the real estate is attached. If I have a property in Minnesota, the holding company initially will be a Minnesota entity so that I've got 
standing in that state. I can evict tenants. I can enforce contracts. I can stand up in court and have my day in court and say, yep, I, I'm, I'm here, Your Honor. If, if you're not, the court has no reason to recognize you, your entity from another state. So whenever there's real estate, we want the real estate to be held in a, an entity where the property is located. Now, who owns that entity? That could be Wyoming. That could be offshore. That could be all kinds of things. But initially, we want real estate so that you have standing in that state. We want it to be held in the state where the property is attached. However, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, intellectual property, um, things like all my interests in other companies, that could be held in a state like a Wyoming, like a Nevada, like a, a state that has really good asset protection. The strongest ones traditionally have been Nevada, Wyoming, Alaska. Um, South Dakota, um, Delaware, those have really good, strong asset protections. So, so on those things, your, your, your million dollar brokerage account, or I don't care, whatever size brokerage account could be held in a state where am I doing business? So I'm, I'm simply owning an asset and there's some great anonym, anonymity laws that exist in, in some states where a lot of us don't live. Those are the basic rules I see for holding companies. Again, if I go back, operating companies where the business is, let's say I'm, I'm doing a shared housing project. I own two houses and I've got a management company. I would file the, the management company where I'm doing business. I would hold the real estate also in the states where the properties are located. Let's summarize this just a little bit, back, going back to our normal um, diagram. The operating company filed in the state where you're doing business. The holding company could be in a strong state, but let's say I've got two pieces of rental properties. These, these are nice commercial properties. And so I'm gonna put this LLC number one, that's in Arizona. Okay, my commercial property, I would held, hold in a single member LLC in Arizona because I want standing in that state. This one over here is in Texas. Okay, so single member LLC filed in Texas. I'm obeying all the laws of Texas. However, who owns this single member LLC? That might be my Wyoming holding company in a very strong state maybe a state that offers anonymity like uh, Wyoming, Nevada, Delaware. And so I want some, so you see what we're doing is we're nesting one holding company inside of another holding company. That's okay. I would title this property in the LLC, in the single member LLC in Texas or Arizona, but who owns that, that legal entity? That would be my holding company. So sometimes I can take holding, I, I would take assets and separate the assets from each other. And I can do that very well in a, a holding company owned by a holding company. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, now we come to the fourth question. How do I tax the little bugger? Now that I've decided I've got a holding company or an operating company, I've decided a business purpose. I've decided the state where I want it to be, and I've decided, with, okay, this is going to be an LLC, or this is going to be a corporation, or a limited part, or whatever the legal structure I'm going to have. Now, it's a totally, totally, completely separate question as to how I'm going to tax it. Here are your options. I could tax things as sole proprietorships, as partnerships, S-corps, C-corps, or nonprofits. Those are your options. So could I have, let's say, an LLC taxed as an S-corp? Yes. Could I have an LLC taxed as a sole proprietorship or a partnership or a C-corp? Yes. Could I take an LLC and tax it as a nonprofit? Yep. But again, the legal structure, should I be an LLC corporation or a limited partnership, is a completely different question than how am I going to tax it. Let's go through these one by one. 
the taxation for a corporation is that there's no separate there is there's not, nothing it's you remember and so anything that would happen in all taxable events would be would show up on your individual 1040 schedule c so i don't have to file a new ta different tax return i just for every business let's say i've got three sole proprietorships everyone would fill out a individual 1040 schedule c and i would attach those to my my 1040 it might complicate my 1040 the more businesses i have but it doesn't require a separate tax return it is a disregarded entity it, 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 it's considered that by the irs which means it's an invisible entity this is different than a pass-through entity like a um a and an, an, an S corporation is a pass-through entity. Um, a partnership is taxed as a partnership. That's a pass-through entity. They require a tax return, and then it 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 reports all the taxable events that happened in that business, and then those taxable events flow through to the owners. This is different. This is a, a totally invisible entity. It doesn't mean that there are no tax consequences. It means all of them throw, flow through to the individual owner. In this case, it's you. And so a disregarded entity, all taxable events show up on your 1040 Schedule C. You're limited in the tax deductions you can have. I can't take a big, um, I, actually, gosh, I can't do big tax returns. I can't take anything. I can't take 100% medical. I, I'm limited to the tax deductions that I can have. And all income is subject to that, that nasty 15.3% self-employment tax. So that's the sole proprietorship. That's number one. Number two, tax is a partnership. Now, this is really good for things that you want the passive income. I want real estate, all the passive losses to come through. Now, it is going to file a 1040 schedule, I'm sorry, it's going to file a 1065 tax return and then give a K-1 to each one of the individual owners. It's great for real estate. It's great for real estate losses. There, there are times, even though you, 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 we're not trying to encourage you to lose money in real estate, but with depreciation deductions, I might have cash flowed positive, but I get this big loss in real estate on paper, it's a paper loss. We like that, those paper losses, because they can offset other income, other investment income, and sometimes a little bit of your W-2 income. We like those losses to flow through to you and not get stuck in a corporation somewhere. It's generally not a good idea for an operating business. We want this to be for holding companies. Holding companies are generally taxed as partnerships um, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and it, it, you don't have a lot of tax deductions. It's not like you're being taxed as a corporation. It's really a holding company. This is how we want holding companies to be taxed. Okay, then there's a thing called an S corporation. This is, again, we're operating a business, but I want some tax deductions that I couldn't get as a sole proprietorship. Um, so it does file a tax return. It's called a 1020S a tax return. And then it gives a 10. So it reports all the taxable events that happened and it gives a K1 form to each one of the individual owners. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, we got to go a little faster. The profits are not subject or may not be subject. Okay, the profits are not subject to the 15.3. However, I do have to take a reasonable salary. It avoids the double taxation of a C corporation. And I'm not subject to accumulated earnings taxes, which means in a C corporation or an entity taxed as a C corporation, I can't keep too much wealth in there. Otherwise, I'm subject to that accumulated earnings tax. S corporations, I can keep all the money I want in there although it might be a dumb idea for an asset protection because we want the corporation to be lean and mean, remember? You're limited to 100 shareholders in an S corp. All right, a C corporation is a separately taxed individual. There, you're gonna file a 1020 S corp. Wow, 
a 10, 1020 corporation tax return. And then it's going to give maybe W-2. Um, it's going to issue W-2s or maybe it's going to issue 1099s or, but, it, but there's no K-1s that are going to go out. Uh, corporate tax rates might be lower and then the personal returns. So we like that. Fiscal year planning options I could do in a C corporation, which means I'm offsetting the calendar year of my corporation and looking for the very best tax advantages for me. I can income throttle, which means at the end of the year, I don't really need the money. I'm going to keep it in the corporation, pay 21% taxes on it, which might be lower than your individual rate. Uh, there's some sub substantial tax deductions I can get out of a C corporation that I can't get anywhere else. And but it does have the potential for double taxation. But I'll tell you, we've we've run a C corporation for almost 20 years and never been subject to more than five hundred dollars in double taxation, because I think we understand how to play the game. We just don't. We at the end of the year, let's say there's no profits. I wiped out the corporation. I paid it out in bonuses and in salaries. And there was no double taxation because there was no profits. OK, well, that's good. I like C corporations too, because when I go to sell a, a business, you almost always add value to the business by taxing it as a C corporation. It's been audited. It's uh, had an outside accounting firms look at it. It's, it's a separately taxed individual. Um, they can show that you, you know, you've, you've made money. It makes it more attractive when you go to sell this business. I, I like that. I, it's also better for, uh, for acquiring business credit if you're a C corporation. Okay, then there's a nonprofit. I'm not going to go into a lot of details on that. Um, some great uh, access to grants, donations. You get discounts at the post office for mass mailing. Your credibility goes up when you're a nonprofit. Uh, it, it's not there's certainly a purpose for a nonprofit corporation. Um, and sometimes we, we don't tout those uh, benefits nearly enough. Okay, so selecting the tax status, you need to understand that a single member, if you're gonna set up a single owner LLC, it is always gonna be default to be taxed as a sole proprietorship. However, I could do a single member LLC, it's just me, I own the asset and I could elect to tax it as an S corp or elect to tax it as a C corp, which means that I'm, I'm an LLC, but I get all the tax benefits of a C corporation, but I don't have to do the minutes and meetings and resolutions and stock certificates and the stock ledgers and the corporate formality stuff. Oh, that's cool. Or I could tax it as an S corporation by simply filing an IRS 2553 form. You see, and then the IRS looks at their looks at your LLC and go, oh, you that that's cool. You get all the benefits of an S corp because you're an S corp, even though you're an LLC taxed as an S-corp. I could take a multi-member LLC. It's always going to default. If you don't do anything, it's going to be taxed as a partnership. However, again, I could file a 2553 or an 8832 form and elect to tax it as a C or an S-corporation. And it gets all the benefits of that with very few exceptions. Okay. What if I want to change the tax status of my entity? Well, first of all, once you form an entity, you've got 75 days to file an election. So let's say I set up a new business entity right now. Okay, I, it, it, today is February, what, 7th, 8th, whatever it is. And I've got 75 days after the, so I, I, I get an EIN number. I'm filling out an SS4 form. I get an election, I, 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 I get my EIN number. Now I've got 75 days from that day to file an election saying, yes, I don't want to be what, what you want me to be. I want to be an S corp or a C corp. I can do that. Um, or I could change the tax status 
on my entity in the first 75 days of each calendar year. Like right now, we're in the middle. If, if you want to, if you've got an existing business, you want to change the tax status, you're right now within that window to be able to do that. Okay, that's good. Um, and again, you, I could take a sole proprietorship, change it to an S or a C corp. I could take an S or C corp, an, an, an S to a C, and you'll notice the arrows that are on the board, the, the, the sole proprietorship to an S corp, to a C corp, Sometimes as businesses grow, that's exactly how the, the progression that they're going to go through. They start as a sole proprietorship, but then they graduate to an S corp, then they graduate to a C corp. I will tell you, though, it's very hard to go backwards, to go from a C to an S, from an S to a sole proprietorship. It, it's not impossible, but you're, you're creating a tax nightmare for your accountant when you decide to go backwards. Um, and sometimes it's because of depreciation deductions and schedules that it, it, it's next to impossible. When, whenever you're, you're going to change tax status, it's always a good idea to get your accountant, your CPA involved and, and get their opinion on these tax status changes. Okay, critical reminders. And then we're almost done and open up, up, up the questions. Um, critical reminders, an operating company needs IRS approved language. And here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit um, and show you a slide. I wasn't going to show you. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, let's go back to my nope, nope, presentation, get questions out of the way. Here we go. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to a slide. There we are. In your corporate documents, there's bylaws. Um, it, it, these, are, these are things that nobody sees unless you, they're subpoenaed, but they're internal documents. Here's your meeting minutes. Here's my corporate resolutions. Be it resolved that the board of directors met today and we decided to, I don't know, whatever. Um, these are your initial meetings where you appointed a president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer. We decided to have a bank account. All these, these are called corporate documents. Again, we're, they're not going to be filed with any state agency, but those corporate documents are absolutely critical. You need IRS approved language if you're going to do certain things. Let's say I've got a C corporation and I want to have a um, 105 medical reimbursement plan. So I, I just me and my wife, we're the only members, we're the only owners, the only employees. And we want that C corporation in that language. We want it to say, we the corporation agrees to reimburse 100% of my family's medical expenses. You can do that, but you have to have the language in somewhere in your corporate documents. I don't care if it's in your bylaws, your meetings, your resolution somewhere. If you're going to do a medical reimbursement plan, you have to have the right IRS language. There's what's called a 1244 stock loss. Let's say after three years, my corporation hasn't made money. I want to write off that expense and get all that money back as a deduction. I cannot do that unless that 1244 stock loss option is included in my initial language. This is what we're going to talk about that a lot when we get to the three day summit is having the right documents and the, the, the right language in there. There's what's called a 1202 qualified business law stock. So let's say I, I grow my business. It becomes a $10 million business. Do you know that there are certain businesses that will be exempt from capital gains? I go, I go to, to sell the business after 10 years. It, it grew from nothing to now it's a $12 million business. And I want to sell my stock. I don't have, I don't have to pay capital gains taxes on it. If I've got the right language in my corporate documents and it's a qualified business. Oh, well, that's cool. 
But if I if I try to do it without that language in my corporate documents, it won't fly in an audit. If I if I want to establish qualified pension plans, you better have the right language in your corporate documents. Purchase key man insurance, expand it all. Those corporate documents, you might think, well, they're not important because um, they're, they're private documents, but this is where the strength and the tax deductions of your business really, really come. Okay, so let's go back to where I was trying to get to. Where were we? Okay, critical reminder. Operating companies need IRS approved language. Holding companies need strong operating agreements. And I keep hitting relationship documents to bind the legal structures together. We're gonna to spend a lot of time when we get to the three-day summit on this. It's not just important that you have a holding company and you have a operating company, but there has to be ties back and forth. I'm leasing or I'm licensing the intellectual property to the operating company. You better have that in writing. I'm managing my properties with a property management agreement. You, there better be an agreement in, in place and you better be following that. The, the, these ties, sometimes as, as asset protection teachers, we simply draw a line, but those lines really mean something. And then last critical reminder is the property maintenance is, is absolutely required on any legal company. I don't care. I, I don't care what company you have, except for a sole proprietorship. You have to keep up the corporate, whatever formalities your corporation requires. Okay, so let's summarize this. There's an operating company that operates the business. If there's substantial assets, we always put those in a holding company. And then we, we're, we're trying to keep the, the valuable business assets out of the operating company. If the corporation, I'm sorry, if the operating company gets sued, likely a corporation, we want it to be lean and mean and not subject to lawsuits. If it gets sued, yes, you have insurance and, and the plaintiff's attorney is happy to settle on insurance because they really don't want your used pencil and your used bottle of water and there's nothing else really in the business. So I'm leasing from the holding company and assigning all risk through a well-worded management agreement, licensing agreement, some type of agreement. I'm shifting all blame up to the operating company and I'm sending as much money as I can down to the holding company where it's not subject to self-employment taxes. So again, what I'm trying to do is separate the active income from the passive income as a tax reduction strategy. And yes, there will be a revocable trust, but that's a discussion for another day. Let me summarize that a little bit different in this, in the next two slides. And this, if you wanna take a picture of this slide, this would be a really good time to do it. Operating companies. They manage the operations of the business. They are taxed as, I'm sorry, they, they are the structure, the legal entity, is they're always going to be corporations or LLCs. Uh, maybe as a sole proprietorship to get it started off the ground, but corporations, LLCs. Most operating companies today are set up as LLCs, not corporations, so that I don't have the corporate formality stuff. Now I have to figure out the taxation. Most operating companies are going to be taxed as a C or an S. The jurisdiction will be in the state where the business is operated. I, I, on a name for the business, I want it to be something that, uh, that's attractive. I'm trying to attract business to my operating company, something that's publicly recognized, something that I can find a domain name for and tie it in, something that, that, that's attractive. We used to use, you know, name, we used to love names that started with AAA because they showed up first in the, in the phone book. We don't do that because we don't use phone books anymore, but something that's attractive. That's going to be different when we get to a holding company, but watch on. Act the activities are going to be active things that you're doing to make money. That's active. 
And the assets of an operating company, you're going to have a bank account. It's going to own the depreciating tools, some inventory, some accounts receivable. Maybe those are the assets of an operating company. Now, keep in mind, this is very different than a holding company. This is another one I want you to take a picture of. This is something I want you to remember. The business purpose is not to operate a business. There's no active activities that happen. It's passive activities only. It owns valuable assets that might be leased, licensed, or managed by an operating company. The legal structure, it would always be an LLC or a limited partnership. The taxation would be taxed as a partnership or maybe as a sole proprietorship. So all the, all the losses, the, the, the paper losses, depreciation, all of that comes down to you personally. The jur jurisdiction would be if it's real estate where the real estate is owned, attached. If it's safe assets, I could go into any state with good asset protection. The name for this, when I go to name this entity, I want something nobody ever recognizes and ties into me. I've had people go, well, I want this to be the Peterson um, um, Peterson Holding Company number one, two, three, four, five, and they set up 10 of them. If, if, if the plaintiff's attorney finds number nine, they're, they're certainly going to be looking for others. So on this, on the name, Something anonymous could be initials. It could be your dog's favorite color. It could be, I don't know, something that it's a keyword that you can remember, but nobody else ties to you. That was different, remember, than a holding, than, than an operating company. You wanted to attract attention. Not this one. I, I, holding companies, I want something, something anonymous. The only activities that go on in, in, in holding companies is passive. I did not manage this portfolio, the management company. I did not manage this real estate. I, you see what we're doing? We're separating for tax reasons and also for asset protection. The assets, anything worth protecting. This is where I'm keeping my real estate, my, my, where I'm keeping my intellectual property and my banking savings accounts and brokerage accounts. Let's summarize one more time. Operating companies formed as corporations or LLCs. Taxed as a C or an S corporation. The jurisdiction is local. The name is something attractive. The, the activities are active business activities. The assets, depreciating tools. A holding company, very different, formed as an LLC most of the time. Sometimes as a limited partnership, it's going to be taxed as a partnership, sometimes as a sole proprietorship. The jurisdiction depends. If it's real estate, where the real estate is attached, safe assets can be in a strong state. Name something unattractive, somebody no, unrelated to you. The activities are only passive in a holding company, and the assets, anything worth protecting. That's sort of now we're going to go over this in, in greater detail at the three day summit, but I hope that this was helpful in understanding how to, if you, this is exactly what I, I walk people through in a little bit different way. And you don't really see my thinking, but when you sit down with me and say, okay, what, what business entity, this is what's going through my mind. I've never really been able to adequately articulate like I tried to do during this. I, I've really spent about three or four weeks putting this presentation together. And hopefully, I, I really hope and pray that it makes a lot more sense to you um, in helping you select the right business entities. So with that, Kendall, let's open this up to questions. Um, yeah. um, and. And I can see, okay, is a sole proprietorship the same as doing business as? No. Do a, a DBA. Um, okay, so I used to work for a company called Net Marketing Alliance. Jay Mitten was one of the principal owners. He was the father of asset protection. And nobody knew 
Net Marketing Alliance because we had so many DBAs. When we went out to a um, medical convention, we were known as National Medical Foundation. So the medical people had confidence that we knew what we were talking about, but we were teaching asset protection. The world, it was the same thing. Um, when we went to a dental convention, it was known as National Dental Foundation. When we went to a women's group, it was known as um, the Women's Conference. When it, and it had 40 or 50 DBAs. Those are DBAs, but that's not the same as a sole proprietorship. The, the DBA is recognized by the state. It, does, it, it can't be a licensed or a registered trademark. Um, you have to stay away from swear words and obscenities, but anything in your state other than what anyone else is using, you can call that. So you can have a corporation or an LLC under multiple DBAs. Again, that's very different than a sole proprietorship. Hey, Don? Yes. So we have a lot of questions coming in. And so I know we got about 10, maybe 15 at the most minutes kind of left. Okay. So, so just a reminder, if those of you who have questions, we probably won't get to all of them. We'll do our best. But if you have questions, we actually do get to pretty much every question during our summits. We try our best. So, so, so Kendall, why don't you read through and, and help me sort through those, and then I'll try to be as brief as I can. Okay. Can foreign nationals partner in a limited partnership? Yes, they can. You will need an I-10 number, so some, a, a form of a um, social security number for, for international people. So yes, absolutely. Does the holding company need to be registered as a foreign entity in the state I reside? No, no, we, we rarely would do that. Let me, let me go back to this diagram here, um, if I can figure out. Okay, this holding company, no, the operating company has to be registered. Um, the holding company, only if there's real estate involved. But if, if, if it's all this does is own other entities or it owns a brokerage account, well, the, the brokerage account isn't doing business. So the holding company, no, the holding company does not have to be in the state where you reside. Okay, so is this like a uh, business? What, what about for a business for Uber, Dash, Amazon deliveries? What kind of business would they look at? Okay, most commonly that would be an LLC taxed as a partnership. LLC, so I don't have to do the corporate formalities. And then the taxation, separate. Now, jurisdiction would be wherever you're running. If you're an Uber driver in, in Wyoming, you would set that up in Wyoming. So business, it's, it's an operating company. It's not a holding company. Jurisdiction, where the, the business is, most commonly it would be an LLC, and then taxation would be generally as, a, as an S-corp. Okay. Great. All right. Is it possible to switch from a C to an S-corp? It is. But again, um, that's difficult depending on the assets that you have. If I've got assets that I've been depreciating, depreciating and there's, there's a depreciation schedule, um, that's going to be very difficult to go from a C to an S. But yes, it's very possible. That's more of an accounting question for your personal business and, and depends on the assets that you have. But yes, you can do it. So the form for, a, for an S corp is 1120S and the C is 1120, right? So 1120S for an S and 1120 for a C. That's, that's the tax returns that are going to be required at the end of the year, yes. Okay, is there a holding company document to be filed to the operating company? Well, you need some type of a management agreement. If, if this holding company is owning intellectual property, there's going to be a licensing agreement. If it's managing properties, there's going to be a property management agreement. Um, th there is going to be some type of a, an agreement between them. And those, those, those agreements need to be in writing because what you're really doing is you're saying this is an arm's length transaction here and you wouldn't hire let's say somebody else to manage your properties without there being a written agreement you wouldn't hire charles schwab to manage your brokerage account without be, there being an agreement in writing and then you follow those agreements and if this operating if, if 
let's say I've got a dental practice, but I'm holding the, my real estate down here in the holding company. And then this month I didn't make a lot of money. So I'm, I'm simply not going to pay the rent. I'm sorry. No, you, you have to pay the rent or there's going to be penalties. We have to treat these companies, even whether you own a hundred percent of each one or, or not, you have to treat these as though they were independent um, and you have to honor those agreements or, or change them. Okay. okay. What's the difference between an LLC taxed as a sole proprietorship versus an S corp? Okay. So it goes back. So, so, so I don't care that if it's an LLC taxed as a sole proprietorship and an LLC taxed as an S corp. Well, one is going to file a tax return. One's not going to file a tax return. The sole, per, the, my wife has a little um, business. We've, We've always taxed that as an LLC, so she she has corporate veil protection. But it was starting out, and and we just disregarded it. It was taxed as a sole proprietorship. Once she started making money, then we graduated that to an S corp. Now we can split her income and say this part was salary and this part was profits, which means I don't have to pay self employment taxes. Um, both of them are all the taxable events flow flow through to our 1040, but but that's the major difference is being able to split income and having some of it not being taxed as a sole proprietorship. I think that's the main difference. Okay, we got a question from an anonymous attendee here. That's not such an anonymous question, very specific here, a very long question. But basically, it's asking with a company with millions of dollars in revenue, multiple partners, they're asking what's better from a tax standpoint, partnership or S Corp. And that's, that's hard to say without looking at it. But generally, partnership being passed through, I mean, that's, that's not generally the case, right? If you have multi millions in revenue, multiple partners, you're probably going to look at more sophisticated structuring than the pass through. You you really are. Once there's millions of dollars, I, I I would be hesitant to say without knowing a whole bunch about your business and about your personal taxation. But it, it used to be so much clearer um, um, between C corps and S corporations. But the deductions have grown together, and you can claim a lot of the same things in a C corp that you can out of an S corp. Um, but but qualified business income where 20% I can take out of an S corp, but not out of a C corp, how much money and the taxation and the, and the corporate tax rates and your personal rates, it really it becomes a much more sophisticated question over the last 10 years than it's ever, ever been. So okay. I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Ask a tax pro like uh, specifics with your taxes for sure. On that or, or come to the, the summit and we can introduce you to really sophisticated um, tax professionals that can help you individually. But in a group setting, I don't know. In a lawsuit, can't a company include both the operating and holding company in the lawsuit? Yes, very much so. So, so let's say you go to a Marriott hotel and you slip and fall and and can you sue the, the real estate company and the operating company and Marriott? Yes, you could. But what would happen in that situation is the holding company that owns the real estate would walk into court, file a motion to dismiss. Look, here's our, here's our agreement. The, the management company was totally responsible at blame. Now, that this would probably be set aside, this motion to dismiss, until the judge hears all the evidence. And then he would probably go, yep, it really was the holding company that was at blame. And so I, I can't keep you from being sued. What I can do is keep them from getting anything in a lawsuit if they get a judgment. And most likely is if you have well-worded agreements shifting the risk up to the operating company um, and you've got good charging order protection down here and good corporate veil protection and decent insurance we can protect you from losing things in a lawsuit that's different than being sued i can't can't keep you from being sued i can keep you from them the judgment creditor from getting anything that's and very different. very unattractive make you very unattractive yes legally right. speaking correct <laughs> yep. okay yep. 
How much does it usually cost to establish a legal structure? You know what? It really depends on where you go. Um, um, if you're coming to attorneys that, that specialize in asset protection, well, you're, you're probably talking for an operating company, two or three thousand dollars at least to set that up and get it set up correctly so that you've got all the right language in there to be able to deduct what you want to deduct. Holding companies um, and, the, the, and the management agreements that tie them all together, it really depends. But holding companies, probably 2500 to 3000 for really good. And I know you can go to a local attorney that came out of law school yesterday and, and he'll set it up for $1,000 or $800. But they're different forms. And I wish I could, I, I could spend a couple hours with you teaching you the language of these holding companies and the language of the operating companies. Maybe we'll have to do that on another webinar, but it's the language, the internal documents that make your structures really bulletproof. And if you're using something that you found off the internet or um, a fill in the blank form or a really good, you know, estate planning attorney that knows nothing about asset protection or a really good, re I don't know, whatever their specialty is. They, to set it up correctly, I would say plan on two to three thousand dollars per entity. Um, is Kendall, has that been your experience too? Yeah, for sure. And, and the thing is, you got to remember, you do get what you pay for. And there are a lot of people who do not understand asset protection. You need kind of those agreements in place with that strong language. I agree. Correct. Correct. Okay. Can you address the issue of an entity that would be used to hold only passive investments? such as syndications or publicly traded securities? Okay, so let's say I've got, I've got a million dollar brokerage account down here and I've invested in you know, this oil thing over here. And so I own a 10% interest in this LLC and I own 5% of this. And I'll, I'll, I, that would be a great idea for me. That would be a great candidate maybe for a Wyoming holding company. We like Wyoming because it's $50 a year, but great asset protection, great anonymity. Your, your name as the manager or member are not going to be publicly recognized. Uh, I, I like Wyoming. Um, Delaware, Nevada, South Dakota require more information to be disclosed, higher filing fees. And so let's say I only have my holding company owns a little piece of this LLC and 100% of this LLC, it owns safe assets like my savings accounts, my brokerage accounts. I'd say that would, that, would, that for me, it'd be a great candidate for a Wyoming holding company. Okay, for both an operating and holding company, do you need bank accounts for each? You mentioned commingling. So how do you do that? Well, we set up a bank account in the operating company. You're like, okay, let's, let's so, say this, holding company simply owns my half million dollar brokerage account. But I need money in the corporation to deduct. I've got a, I've got a little travel and I want to deduct 100% of my family's medical expenses. So I, I take out of the operating or out of the holding company and I shift up, let's say, $2,000 a month to, to manage and operate or whatever is reasonable. I don't care. Maybe it's five thousand dollars a month, whatever, whatever is reasonable to operate to, to manage my portfolio. Now I've got yes. Do I need a bank account or at least a brokerage account, some way of paying the operating company? And the operating company, I need the ability to, whether it's a corporate credit card or an ATM card or something, I need a way to expense the travel that I need, that the perks that I need. Um, I needed to go buy a new computer. I needed to write off my cell phone. I need to be able to do that. And so uh, commingling is when you're just, it's, it's willy nilly and I moved money, but there was no real reason. I just wanted money in the operating company or, or I had too much and I moved it down to the holding company without a business purpose for it. There always has to be a business purpose for every transaction, financial transaction that you make. And otherwise, if it's willy nilly and I can't tell the difference between this set of books and this set of books, that's what that that's when you've commingled funds. And bank accounts generally that if you have one in each, 
that it actually establishes more legitimacy to that entity as well. You're, you're treating it respect. Absolutely. Okay. Now this is hard to do, Michael. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, you're talking about uh, structuring your entities and community property states, hard to do, you know, time, that sort of thing. You really can't protect against things such as divorce with an entity structure. It, it, it depends. If, if, if this is anticipated, there's prenuptial agreements. There, as long as as long as we're not trying to hide assets from a spouse, uh, and that's when that's when people get in trouble. But can you go into a marriage and still preserve your assets and your inheritances? And yes, you you absolutely can. Um, I really I really see it a lot when people are trying to hide assets from their spouse. They're using you know, well. South Dakota trusts, and they're using Wyoming holding companies and trying not to disclose. I, I see it a lot when, um, I, let's say a man has paid the, the mortgage for the last 30 years, and, and he thinks that because the wife didn't pay the mortgage, he owns the house. She never paid the mortgage. I paid the mortgage. She didn't contribute to my 401k. I did. But, but that, that, that's going to be ripped apart by the divorce judge most often saying, no, you were a partner for 26 years. And no, she, she stayed home, raised the kids, and this is 50-50. However, that set aside, what we do see in divorce is one partner that, that does the real estate gets the real estate holdings. One partner that runs the business gets to run the business. And, and, you know, the divorce judge, even though they've got a really bad reputation, their, their goal is to make it an equitable distribution. Yep. Okay. Can a revocable trust be a holding company? No. Um, we don't. Uh, can it be? Yes, it could be. But there's no asset protection for a revocable trust. Remember that it's revocable, it's amendable, it's changeable. You can move the assets in and out, in and out, in and out. If you always have access to those assets, um, a judgment creditor would. So a revocable trust is not a great holding company it, because there's no asset protection. Um, it, we often use it as such, um, but that's usually an error. Now, if I don't have assets worth protecting, Meaning, I, there's, you know, it's not worth it setting up a holding company and having a separate tax return. Then, yes, the trust becomes, in essence, a holding company. You put your car in there. You put your, your house in there. You put, you know, your brokerage accounts in the trust. But the trust is really a probate tool. It's not an asset protection tool. And when we start using a revocable living trust as a holding company, and it's holding a lot of assets, know that you're putting them at jeopardy in the event that there's a lawsuit lien or judgment. Okay. And we're pretty close on, I mean, uh, we have a ton of questions still coming in. I know there's no way we're getting- to Oh my questions. gosh. <laughs> All right. Well, so, let's, let's answer four or five more questions and the rest we're going to have to refer to the hotline. You're yeah. always welcome to call our company at 800-276-1430. Kendall, maybe you put that in the in the chat yeah. screen, um, or you come to the summit where we'll answer. But let's answer. Let, if you're okay, let's answer. Sure. You know, yeah, four, fine. Five uh, so I will say a lot of the questions too coming in. How can we have a consult? How can we talk to someone about this? Absolutely, call us. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat now. You can register for the summit. You can email us. There's a lot of ways to get a hold of us, and we could absolutely get you in the right direction with someone who can help you tax asset protection, estate planning, all those. And really that's why we always talk about the asset protection summit, because that's where you'll meet tax asset protection, financial, legal, all the experts are there and they should answer a lot of these questions, frankly. It, will you be repeating the course? No, but, but Kendall, will you send out a link to yeah. this recording? It's being recorded, I assume, right? It oh, is. And no. yeah, it'll probably come tomorrow. Uh, so watch tomorrow morning. We'll have a link for everybody. It'll be posted via YouTube. Especially what I want you to, if you don't get anything else, get this screen, capture this, and scrap, capture the two previous ones. This one, the operating company, the basics, and this one. If you don't capture anything else, capture those three, 
screens and we want you to have it. This is this is what it's about. And yep, okay. You are uh, talking about a Wyoming company structured as an LLC and tax as a partnership. And they're looking to start purchasing tax liens, distressed mortgages, so real estate. Uh, can they both be purchased in a holding company or how would you structure that? Okay, tax liens um, is, is technically a safe asset. Let's go back to this picture of the holding company. Um, we, we traditionally don't want to mix tax liens with tax deeds. Tax liens, somebody, the county put a lien against the property and you're simply buying the property, but, but it's a, a fairly safe asset. Nobody's going to so, sue you because you put a lien against the property. You didn't put the lien against the property. You bought it from the county and you're hoping to get your 18% or whatever interest rate you, you do. And so that could be in your holding company with lots of liens, um, notes, other things. Well, what I wouldn't want to do in this holding company is put in a deed, a, a, a tax deed, because you own the, the deed to the property, you own all the risk. So if I'm doing that, I would use like a little single member LLC off the side. It owns the, the deed to the property. And that would be, you know, the single member LLC owned by the holding company. But I wouldn't take, you know, a big, a, a lot of money in a holding company and, and assign deeds to that, not liens and deeds. They're very different assets. Okay. All right. So uh, an entity buying and selling of cars through uh, like, like rental company Turo, will the sell the assets be done by the holding company or the operating company? That's a good question because their vehicles, not usually high value assets. So it could be through the operating as well. That's, that's a good question. Most often that would be done through the operating company. If you're selling, you know, Jay Leno cars, the million dollars a piece, <laughs> I, I would change that and go, I, I would do that in a holding company. Um, but for the most part, if you're, you're selling an average Chevy, Ford, Toyota, whatever, I'd probably do it in the operating company. It's like flipping houses. We, we flip houses usually in an operating company. We hold rentals in a holding company. Very different asset. Okay. My LLC taxed as a C-Corp reimburses medical expenses and insurance. I know of no special approval for this. Is that true? Look at IRS section 105 of the Internal Revenue Code. So yes, it's very much approved. Um, so an LLC taxed as a C-Corporation, if the right language is in there, you've adopted the 105 section language, then you can um, reimburse yourself 100% for the medical expenses for you and your dependents. However, where you get into trouble might be discrimination. If you're going to do it for yourself, you have to do it for all the employees. If you're the only employee, great. There's no discrimination problems. But I can't open this up to all the employees. I, I guess you could, but you may not want to open it up to all the employees. Um, there, there is discrimination rules. Okay. Okay. If you start an online business like jewelry uh, for equal partners, is LLC the best option if you had two partners? Um, it certainly could be. Um, most, again, mo most small business today are set up as LLCs so that they're not required to do the, the annual shareholders meeting, the board of directors meeting, have corporate resolutions. Uh, most small businesses, e even with, with or without partners, are set up as LLCs. Okay. A good question here. Is there a difference between an S-Corp or an LLC tax is an S corp. What's the difference? Generally, not on the tax side. No, what we're doing is we're saying on the on the legal structure side, I don't have to do all the corporate formality nonsense that that I'm probably not going to do anyway. On the tax side, um, there is some differences. Um, some states like California will tax corporations at a different rate. Florida will do the same thing a tax corporations differently than LLCs taxed as corporations. But generally, across the board, generally, if I can deduct it out of an S corp, I can deduct it out of an LLC taxed as an S corp. That's a general rule. I know there's a couple exceptions to that, um, but generally 
99% of everything you want to do, you can do out of an LLC tax as an S-Corp, same as you could out of an S-Corp. Okay. okay. Is the series LLC in Texas different than a using a holding company? It's basically a holding company, right? <laughs> it can be. It can be both. It can be a holding company and an operating company. We really didn't spend time on, on, on series LLCs, although I know that it's on the agenda to be talked at on our March 7th three-day summit. And Clint, I've seen his PowerPoints, and I, I know that he's going to cover series LLCs specifically. So That's not sometimes it could be both. Yep. Okay. Under what circumstances would you recommend setting up a nonprofit and in what circumstances is that not recommended? Oh, <laughs> that's a whole, a whole different ball game. We'll, we'll yeah, cover that, that in a different that... webinar. We cover nonprofits, right, Don? Yeah, we are. We've got somebody, somebody scheduled to cover nonprofits and all the benefits of that. That might be, I'd like to know what you're doing and see whether that would be a good candidate. But across the board, that's a that's a 10 minute discussion that we probably shouldn't do right now. But you call us tomorrow at the hotline and I'll be happy to answer your questions. When is the best time of the year to form a corporation? Whenever I need the tax perks and whenever I when I'm hiring employees and whenever I, <laughs> whenever I need the legal strike, I can set it up anytime. And with the C Corp, I can choose to tax it. At any time of the year, our corporation, Kendall, as you know, ends December, I don't know, January 31st and starts February 1st. School districts often start in 1st of September and run till the end of August. Um, so LLCs taxed as C-Corps and, and, and C-Corps can pick whatever time. So when... When's the best time of year? Whenever you kick in your business into gear and, and get started is when I would set it up. Okay. Should an LLC holding company for personal trading investments need a C-Corp? And what if the break-even costs of setting up the C-Corp are greater than the, the deductions? Of okay. The I would never set up a holding company as a C-Corp. I would always set up that holding company taxed as a partnership or as a sole proprietorship. Don't do that. But I, what's that? Yeah, don't do that, Doug. That could be a taxable event for you. Yeah, I, I, I don't want my stocks held in a C-Corp. Um, a C-Corp, when you put those assets in, it's like the old-fashioned mousetrap where the mouse runs in, but he can't get out. You put those assets in a C-Corporation, you lose the, the tax benefits they get locked into the C corporation, the operating company. I'm setting up my own little Charles Schwab. Now that I like tax as a C corp, but this holding company down here, I would never do that. I, I would always tax it as a partnership or as a sole proprietorship. Okay. And that's a good question. I'll be starting a home flipping business in a few months. Careful with that. There's a lot of things there we want to cover. But the first thing I should do, should they register an LLC, holding company, operating company, or buy the house? What's the first thing generally? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in a, I, I've heard it said by a lot of people, the very just buy the house and, and, and do your first flip uh, and don't set up a legal structure um, and don't let the legal structure get in the way of you making money in real estate. However, uh, on an asset protection side, it's, it, it's really dumb advice. I would set up, personally, most, most small flippers are setting up as a LLC in the jurisdiction where you're going to be flipping houses. If, if that's New Jersey, set it up in New Jersey. Most commonly, it would be taxed as an S corporation to get started and as a C corporation once you build up momentum and start flipping more houses. Um, that would be the common way that the flippers operate. Yeah. Be careful of dealer status too. That's probably another discussion for another day. Yeah. If you're holding properties, you've got some rentals over here and you're flipping over here. Uh, we need to talk because that's, that's totally different animal. Yep. Okay. Uh, this, um, how does a Texas C Corp terminate a CEO if they steal with the resolution? Does the change, has, do the change have to be filed with the Secretary of State? So that's corporate officers. How does that work? 
Yes. Okay. So, so the board of directors would meet and fire that they would have a meeting. You'd keep minutes at it and fire the CEO or replace the CEO. And then um, your article in Texas, it's called articles of formation would have to be amended to recognize any, any change in the corporate office. Okay. And this is a good question. Can you explain why you gradually move from an LLC to an S corp, then maybe a C corp, if why not just start with a C corp if the benefit is greater? And you certainly can. Yeah, certainly can. Certainly can. But sometimes if I've got an idea, a business idea, and I don't, I don't want to set up a C corporation for every business idea I've ever had in my life. Oh my gosh, it would don't drive my wife nuts to have 47, you know, C corps. Sometimes I start out small. I see if this is a viable business. I do that as a sole proprietorship. Um, the first little bit, it, it, so it depends. If, if this is, you, you're, you're sure this is going to go. I, I've invested money. I know this is going to go. You're right. You would set it up as a C-Corp or an LLC tax as a C-Corp and just go. It, it, so I, I tend to move a little slower than my wife likes me to move. And so, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm a little bit more conservative. Yeah. Anyway, so either would be appropriate. Make sure it's a viable option first. Makes sense. If it's already going and making money significantly, yeah, get get that tax structure set up that works for you. Yeah. Okay. So, so a couple of weeks ago, I was down um, in, in Phoenix talking to a group of a residential assisted living. They're, they're, some of them were absolutely positive that they they oh, good. Let's set up the business structure, and and it's going to cost you two or three thousand dollars to set this up. But damn it, do it right. Just you're going to have you're going to have elderly people. You're going to have employees that don't mess around with this and, and don't, don't start it as a sole proprietorship, go to an end, just set it up. Right. But you know, a little lawn mowing business, I don't know whether this is going to work or not. And it, it can graduate. Yeah. What about like, very sounds, different. Sounds like my treadmill, Don, I was sure I was going to use that treadmill. Every day. <laughs> It just didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the process to dissolve an LLC if it's not producing income anymore? Okay. What's next? So if what's the process to dissolve an LLC if it's not producing income? Um, you, the process of setting up the LLC was you filed articles of formation or articles of organization with the state simply notify the state that that you're not going to that you're going to dissolve it or simply pay don't pay your filing fee next year and it and they kind of dissolve it internally for the corporation when or, or for the for the IRS the last tax return right on their final tax return or there's a little box and some of the, let them know that this is your final return and you've dissolved it. So with the state and the federal government, one of the little tricks that I've learned years ago is that the IRS can go back and, and audit a business only three years from the last time you filed a tax return. So if your business has made a lot of money and a lot of you're, you're concerned about it, that audit, file a, you, you dissolve the business today. I am nothing else. So next year, I'm going to file a no activity return. The next year, no activity, no activity. I do that three years in a row, and that's not going to open. It. And, and then I send file, final tax return. That way, a, a final tax return is always going to cause an internal audit by the IRS. They may not tell you, but a final tax return will always cause an, an, an IRS audit. Um, Somebody wow. higher up is always going to look at that tax return. But if there's nothing that they can only go back three years and it was zero activity the last three years, uh, just a little tax tip. So for whatever that's worth. Okay. Can you please explain about splitting the income between self-employment and non-self-employment? Okay. Let's say in my operating company up here made $100,000 and it's taxed as an S corporation. And I take out a normal salary, which I don't know, in, in my case, in your case, might be $1,000 a week. So that, that $52,000 comes down to me. I have to pay ordinary income tax on that and 
15.3% self-employment taxes. But what happens to the other $48,000? Well, that's considered to be just the income of the company. That's the dividends. That, when that comes down to me, I still have to pay ordinary income tax. But because it's a dividend, it's passive. I don't, I, 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 I've saved myself um, probably close to $7,000 uh, by, by having that S corporation. Anything that comes to you as a dividend is not subject to self-employment taxes. You want everything that comes out of that S corporation to be coming as a dividend there. Therefore, the IRS wants everything to, that you take out to be taxed as, as a wage or a salary. Somewhere you're going to have to get with your accountant, figure out what's a reasonable salary for you to take and the rest um, take out as a dividend. The S corporation allows you to do that. If, if this operating company were a sole proprietorship or a C corporation and you take money out, chances are you're going to be paying both sides. You're going to be paying ordinary income tax and self-employment taxes. That's one of the beautiful things of an S corp. I love it is the ability to split income. Can you tax a holding company as a partnership with your spouse or does it have to be somebody else besides your spouse? Well, a holding company, whoever owns the holding company, um, can you tax it to yourself or to your spouse? Yes, you could. But if you're going to file a joint tax return, it's going to come to your tax return anyway. Um, That's owned by both of you. It contributes, whoever contributes the assets, right? Correct. Holding yeah. company. An, an, an operating company is whoever is going to manage the business gets the ownership. The holding company is whoever contributes the assets gets the ownership. So could I assign 100% of this? I contribute the assets and assign the, the ownership of the holding company to my spouse. Yes, that's not a taxable event. If I assigned everything to my son or my parent, that would be a taxable event. And I'd have to stay within the gifting rules and all that kind of stuff. So be careful on changing ownership. Uh, whoever contributes the assets generally gets the ownership on a holding right. company. And Sherry, uh, yes, uh, we actually take the questions as they come in. So there are questions that that are uh, that really came in before yours. So yes, we get them as we, we answer as we get them. So <laughs> thank you anyway. Um, okay, uh, Bruce must specify business purpose and doing asset protection examples. What, what can't you do well after a lawsuit? So maybe fraudulent conveyance is what you're, you're asking about here. Yeah. There, this in the middle of a lawsuit, you have to be really careful. You can always expand the business purpose, but you can't, you, you can't be trying to defraud somebody that has a legitimate claim against your business. I spent a lot of time at the three-day summit talking about fraudulent conveyance and, and when is it too late? And maybe we ought to do another webinar on that, Kendall, I don't know, but, but that's, that's a, a very sophisticated area of law. Um, what yeah. can you do after a lawsuit's been filed? Um, your books have been written about that, and, and, but I don't know that we have time to I, but call me if you have questions and I, I can help you individually where I, it, it's hard in a group setting. Okay. And Todd's asking, is this framework useful for holding crypto? So cryptocurrencies like, a, you know, liquid uh, type of investments. Absolutely. That would be in a holding company. If, if there's, if you got $3,000, I wouldn't set up a separate holding company, but, uh, but if you've got substantial assets relative to your overall net worth, if this, that, crypto is a big part of my sep of my my overall net worth i would want to protect it in a holding company could it be managed by my corporation yes of course it could it's perfect for holding for brokerage accounts trading accounts crypto anything like that yes your crypto wallet same thing put that all in there for sure yep, yep. what if a what if the trust so this goes back to the revocable living trust question what if the trust has asset protection so they're asking about holding assets in a, I assume, revocable living trust. So we're talking about revocable living trust in your example. Uh, do they have asset protection? No, but a, an irrevocable trust would have asset protection. A revocable living trust by its nature doesn't have asset protection. The, the only problem or the biggest problem with the irrevocable trust is that 
It's irrevocable. You put assets in an irrevocable trust, you ain't getting them back. And somebody else is traditionally going to be the trustee of that. And you've lost a little bit of control. I know they say you can't, and you can still control the trustee, but the more control you exercise over that trustee, the less asset protection you have and the greater chance that it can be pierced. If you can get access to those assets anytime you darn well please in an irrevocable trust, likely a judgment creditor, if they push it, can also get access to those. So <laughs> um, yes, an irrevocable trust would offer good asset protection if it's run right. Be careful because it's irrevocable. <laughs> Be very yep, careful. Yep, 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 yep. John, thank you, says uh, very well organized and presented. Thank you. I agree, Don. Very well thank done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ron, for online business, is it better to open an LLC on the same in the same state you live, or could it be one of those protective states like uh, uh, you know Delaware, Wyoming, Las, Las Vegas, or Nevada? Uh, on, online business, I'm not technically doing business in any state, and so I could do that would be a good candidate for a Wyoming or a Delaware or a maybe a Nevada business, but be careful. Some states like California, if you're if you're thinking about your online business, you've crossed the line and now they want to tax it. So be careful on the jurisdiction of which I across the board. Yes, an online business could be run out of another state. California. Oh boy. Okay, so the last two questions here we're going to get to uh, are both pretty much the same question, asking about real estate agents. And should a real estate agent create an LLC as an S or a C Corp, or should a real estate agent use a C Corp or an S Corp? Okay, most commonly, real estate agents will set up, it's an operating company, it's, it's, it's an active business. So most of the time, it would be formed as an LLC in the state where, wherever you're doing, wherever you're licensed, and most commonly it would be taxed as an S corp. Now, <laughs> there's variances and there's lots of, but but most common, most most real estate agents that I've seen set up an LLC in the state where they're doing business and tax it as an S corp. Easy peasy. All right. Well, I think uh, that looks like we got them, Don. I'm amazed. Good job. Wow. That's All amazing. right. Very impressive. Well, we went very much over time. I'm so sorry. Um, I did that. And we so appreciate you being here. I hope this has been well worth your time. Um, we've tried to present it in a, in a whole different way and a different light. And, and so this recording will be It'll be sent out to you tomorrow. You're welcome to go over it and review it. You can't steal my PowerPoint, but we're not going to make that available to you. I'm sorry. Um, thank you for your nice com comments. We appreciate it. Oh, some really good friends. Yeah, some great we comments. And an anonymous to, your, to answer your question there, uh, he's asking if you can have a operating company run the business and hold the, the property at the same time. No, those definitely need to be separate generally. Probably give us a call. We can give you that uh, direction individually. Yeah, because if you're holding real estate in an operating company and the operating company gets sued, everything inside of that legal bubble is susceptible to the lawsuit. And so can you do it? Absolutely, you can. Too many people do it. We think it's a really stupid idea. We don't want you to do it. That's, But can you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You can do whatever you want, but but on an asset protection side and from a tax side, we think it's okay. We don't use the word stupid in customer service, but it's unwise. How's that? Okay. Better ways to, to structure than that. Okay. <laughs> and we'll show you a lot more during the summit. I put the <laughs> link there in the chat screen. You got a link there. Just click that, register. The event's free. I mean, it's online. We've made it free. It can't be any easier. And I know it's three days, but we always, you, you won't believe it. I'm not kidding. If you haven't attend, you will learn a ton. And it's something that you should learn to benefit yourself and your family. You'd be surprised what you learn. And so much better instructors than I've been to you tonight. Um, we, but we hope you've learned something and this has been worth your time. Thank Not you. true. A lot more of Don at the summit. So please come. <laughs> He's incredible. <laughs> thanks, Don. All right. Everyone, thanks for being with us. Have a great night. Thanks, thanks for everyone. Okay.